Our very next presenter is somebody who is from the medical profession, and that's Dr. Paul Updike. Dr. Updike graduated from Lemoyne College and the University of Buffalo School of Medicine in 1995. He completed his internship and residency at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire, and White River Junction Veteran Hospital in White River Junction, Vermont. Since 1998, Dr. Updike has worked at Sisters Hospital in Buffalo, where he currently serves as the medical director of the St. Vincent's Health Clinic and the medical director of chemical dependency. He is board certified in internal medicine and certified in addiction medicine and pain management. With that, I would ask Dr. Updike to please come to the podium. Good morning, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. As um, I was just outlined, I'm, a, I'm an internal medicine physician. I'm a UB graduate. Um, most of my day is spent dealing with patients who are addicted to some chemical or another, mostly opiates. I also have an interest in chronic pain management. So as someone who works with these patients on a regular basis, patients who are struggling you know, with addiction, I just want to say what a great honor and pleasure it is for me to be here to address this audience. It's not the usual type of audience that I would address. You know, usually I just talk to doctors. So it's, it's really been a great experience for me. Um, I'm sure I speak for everyone who's involved in this conference. There's been a lot of great people that I've met and are, that, are, um, that have helped to put this together. That um, it really is great to see people from such different backgrounds coming together to try to look at this problem, try to address it. Um, we have representatives from the medical community, from law enforcement, we have elected officials. Um, thank you so much for your interest and participation. I am sure that most of us here have had some sort of personal experience with this problem. Uh, it, it, it has caused such pain and suffering in our community. Um, it has affected our friends, our families, our colleagues, our patients. Um, it really is, as has already been mentioned, a real epidemic. Um, as we will see, and you know, we've really gotten already a really good sense of this, this has not really happened overnight. Um, this is, is really a very complex problem. You know, when I look at it from a medical perspective, it really is, you know, in a way very, very fascinating to watch how this has progressed, as terrible as it's been. Um, the effects are seen across the spectrum of professions, though. You know, like we've already been talking about, this is not just a medical problem. This is not just a matter of doctors write too many pres um, prescriptions. It is not just that. So um, I have been tasked to look at this from a medical perspective. Um, and it is my hope to take a look at things, take a look at how we got to this point, take a look to where, uh, where we are, and to look at some solutions on how to make this problem better. So with that, those are the objectives. We're going to be looking at um, why people like these medications so much. What is it about opiates that people like? There was just a question about other medications. We're gonna to touch briefly on other prescription pills that are abused. Taken on total, those medications are not nearly as harmful as the prescription pain medications. Um, but most of what we're talking about here applies to all of these pills that can be um, abused. We're going to talk a little bit about what addiction is. There's oftentimes uh, some misunderstanding about what, what we mean when we say addiction. From a medical standpoint, it really has a very specific meaning. We're going to overview the problem um, of prescription uh, abuse, looking at kind of how this problem developed and where we're at now. And finally, the call to action, which is the, the theme of this conference. Uh, what are some you know, concrete, things that we can do to impact this problem, hopefully to make it better. So what are these things, these opiates that we're talking about? Uh, they're all the compounds that are derived from the poppy plant, um, both natural and synthetic, including our own endogenous opioids, which means 
uh, the, the opiates that we prescribe are very similar to chemicals that are naturally made in our brains, known as endorphins. Endorphins are very important chemical mediators for human beings to have. They regulate both emo emotional and physical health. So these receptors where these medications have effect have, are found throughout the body, but particularly in the central nervous system, they have most of their effect in the brain. They have good effects, therapeutic effects that we like, which primarily mediate our response to pain, but they also have other effects uh, where they affect um, parts of the brain that mediate the pleasure sensation, can lead to the sensation of euphoria, which is also known as a high. They also have other effects in areas like where we have the respiratory drive in our brains, and when taken in excess, can cause respiratory depression, overdose, and death. So that's what we're talking about when we say an overdose. And I listed some of the commonly known medications. I'm sure most people are familiar with these, but these are the medications that we're talking about primarily. There are other medications, as I said, the set of hypnotic medications, primarily the benzodiazepines with some of the common names here, and also the stimulants, the amphetamine-based medications with the common names listed here. The set of hypnotics are used to treat anxiety disorders primarily, the, the stimulants used primarily to treat ADHD. These medications can also be abused in ways similar that we're gonna talk about the opiates. But again, taken on total, not nearly as big of a problem, at least nationally and in our community, as the opiate-based medications. So, why are these medications addicting? All drugs of abuse affect the brain's pleasure centers, okay? And I hope that this is projecting enough to see that, at least in the, the second panel here, when we do something that's supposed to be naturally rewarding, like eat, it causes a reaction in those centers, and we experience that, that experience as, as pleasurable. Now, all drugs of abuse work in similar ways in these centers, such that when they're taken, it kind of overloads that response, and though that is experienced is very intensely pleasurable, and therefore it is very rewarding and causes that behavior to continue. As that behavior continues, other parts of the brain start to become affected as well. And this did project well enough. What you can see here is, is that as drug abuse goes on, the brain begins to function abnormally. And you don't have to be a doctor or you know, a neuroanatomist to understand this, to see this picture here. On the top portion on the, on the left is a normal brain. On the, on, the, on the right is a diseased brain, a, a brain that is addicted to cocaine. And you can see that that brain is not the same as the normal brain. And basically what that means is that brain is not functioning normally anymore. And it is not dissimilar to how we really look at other chronic diseases, such as heart disease, which is the, the example in the bottom portion there. There's a normal heart, a diseased heart. The diseased heart is not functioning normally any longer. As this impaired physiologic and metabolic process continues, what it leads to is impaired behavior in patients who are addicted to drugs. This abnormality can, can improve with abstinence, but it never really reverses itself totally. And that's really the kicker here. It just, people really are never cured of their addiction. So addiction really is properly thought of as a chronic disease. I like this slide because to me, it kind of shows how complicated addiction is in kind of a simplified way. Not everyone who takes these prescription pain medications becomes addicted to them. So why do some people become addicted? Well, there are certain factors, particularly genetic factors, environmental factors, that put people at greater risk to develop addiction. So uh, these are listed here, um, but particularly young age, genetic factors, prior chemical use, these put people at greater risk to develop addiction, such that when you introduce a drug, such as a prescription pain pill, the, the patients who are at risk have a much higher chance of developing addiction to that than people who don't have these factors. I put this slide in here just again to get a visual. There's gonna be some slides that are, are copied, so to speak, which is, I think is okay, because these points are also very important. Disease, the addiction is a disease of the youth, unfortunately. 
Our youth are really affected severely by this. Most drug addictions start when people are in their teenage years. Not all, but it is relatively uncommon for adults, especially older adults, to develop addiction. They may have addiction into their later life, but usually the exposure and the addiction starts when they're younger. So here's a news flash. Teenagers can make bad decisions, okay? Some of that is a physiologic problem. And this did project well too. You can see that as we age, the brain changes. The brain ages as we get, go, as we get older. And as we get into our 20s, the brain be begins to mature. And again, not that you have to be a doctor to, to sort of understand this, but the, the part that's in red, that's the frontal lobe, okay? And that doesn't mature until we're in our, to our 20s. The frontal lobe is what is responsible for our executive decision-making skills. So we make poor decisions as, we get, uh, as we're young. As we get older, our frontal lobes develop, and hopefully we start to make better decisions. Now, unfortunately, the developing brain is also very, very um, uh, uh, sensitive to the toxic effect of these medications. So not only do kids make poor decisions, so they might try taking these medications, but they also have much worse effects from, from these medications than people who are older. I don't want to bore everybody with too much with a lot of terminology, but I do always, usually when I talk, I like to talk about what, what is addiction? You know, we throw the term around all the time, I'm addicted to this or that, I'm addicted to chocolate. What, what is addiction really, what do we really mean when we say it? Addiction properly understood is a chronic relapsing disease uh, characterized by compulsive drug seeking and abuse despite its known harmful consequences. So use despite harm, and that's really the hallmark of addiction. We continue to use whatever substance we're talking about despite mounting evidence that is harmful for us. You know, if we, rational people would be like, oh, look at all the bad things that are happening to me. I should stop doing this. It, that's, that's what characterizes addiction. Initial use is volitional. People choose to use. But eventually, and relatively quickly, especially with opiates, the ability of the person to control the use becomes very impaired. That's part of what that the, the abnormal brain scan is showing that our ability to control use becomes impaired as we, start to, as we continue to take these medications. And the last point there is just to, 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 to point out that these medications can be abused in a number of different ways. As the addiction progresses, usually people use, start to use the medications in more and more aberrant ways, such as sniffing or injecting, in, a, in an effort to try to get more effect. And I really don't want to uh, be, uh, you know, bore people too much with the psychiatric diagnostic codes for um, addiction and abuse, only to point out that there are really specific criteria that we use when looking at a patient who might be having trouble with these medications. It's not just something we throw around. They should meet certain criteria. And that addiction is a spectrum, a spectrum of disorder. Just like some people have bad diabetes, some people have diabetes that can be managed with diet. Some people don't have as bad of an addiction problem, so to speak, as others. That's what abuse is called. It is sort of a less intense problem. Up to addiction, which is also known as dependence. So not to confuse the terms we use, we understand it as addiction. And as you can see here, there are a number of different things that can characterize addiction. But if, if, if a person just has withdrawal, meaning they get withdrawal symptoms if they stop taking these medications, that is not enough to diagnose an addiction problem. The first two are the physical characteristics of addiction. The last five points there, again, to reiterate, are the, are the negative consequences associated with the use. So if we start to look at a person's life, we start to see, again, that there's this mounting evidence that there's harm caused from whatever drug we're talking about. So as I've already outlined, not everybody who takes these medications becomes addicted to them, all right? I hear it all the time, Doc, why, do, why, are, we, why are people getting these medications? I, I just don't understand. Well, they have a real legitimate medical purpose, okay? And there's already been some discussion of that, and, and it's, it's very good to hear because chronic pain is a, quite a terrible problem too. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but not everyone who takes these medications becomes addicted to them. Withdrawal does not equal addiction, as I've already outlined. 
Physical dependence, which means that you would get withdrawal symptoms if we stop the medication, is really an expected consequence of long-term use of the opiates. So if, again, you're taking these pain medications and you're taking them properly and the doctor just stops the, the medication and you have withdrawal, that does not mean that you're addicted to the medication. And I will tell you when you review the medical literature, and even in my own practice, which I deal with this all day long, it's real hard to determine what the real addiction risk is with these medications. In some studies, it's as low as 1%. In other studies, over 25% or even higher percentages of patients who are exposed to these medications can develop an addiction disorder. I thought it might be interesting to get a little bit of a historical background on where this problem has sort of come from. I mean, after all, opiates have been around since before recorded history, okay? The opium plant has been used medicinally and recreationally for thousands of years, so why are we having such problems now? It wasn't until the 1800s that we really identified what the uh, active ingredient in opium was, which is morphine, okay? As our knowledge of what made opium active increased, it be, it, morphine started becoming used more often in the 1800s. Heroin was synthesized by Bayer, a drug company, and marketed as a medication that was supposedly less toxic than uh, morphine. It turns out that was wrong, of course, and into the 20th century we saw increasing troubles with opiates. As they were used more commonly, like they are today, we started seeing more and more trouble with them. So that countries started trying to put into place measures that would limit the use of these medications. That culminated in this country in 1914 with the passage of the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act, which makes it illegal for doctors to prescribe opiates for purposes of treating an addiction. So, you know, I can't just prescribe someone morphine still today if they're addicted to morphine to treat their addiction. It can only be done in specialized treatment clinics. So that's kind of the way things were. In, into the early 20th century, as the, as the 20th century progressed, we became more and more comfortable prescribing these medicines for acute pain and cancer-related pain, which is very, very appropriate. The risk of a developing addiction when used in these purposes is quite low. But the problem came into the 1980s when we saw a call for broader use of these medications for chronic non-malignant pain. Now, chronic non-malignant pain is a very serious health problem. Many, many people suffer from it. And there was a recognition that there was not enough being done from, from in the medical community to address this problem on a societal level. And so this call to ad address these, these, these patients more aggressively uh, was very well-intentioned, very well-intentioned. But it led to, there was unforeseen consequences from this call. That led us into the 1990s, which was the so-called decade of pain. The decade of pain, the medical profession essentially sort of declared war on pain, and we're going to really get aggressive with treating pain. Well, again, there was this unforeseen fallout from that war, and that's the crisis that we're dealing with now. At the same time in all of this, there was the introduction of other medications, uh, opiate formula, uh, opioid formulations such as OxyContin that were quite potent, and all of these things kind of came together. There was a dramatic rise in the use of these medications, and unfortunately there's been a dramatic rise in the complications of their use as well. And this last point is just another way of saying it, that we're prescribing a lot more opiates than we used to. So, where are we now? Hydrocodone is the most prescribed medication in this country. We already heard the statistic how we Americans consume many, many more opiates than the rest of the world. Emergency room visits are up. We've already talked about that. People who abuse opiates have much higher direct and indirect health care costs. Um, it's, it's a mess. This slide was already shown. I wanted to put it, again, to get a visual. More and more people are dying from overdoses from these medications, and you can see, as I talked about, as we got into the 80s, into the 90s is when that overdose uh, death rate really uh, increased dramatically. You could pretty much overlay a slide that showed the prescription of opiates increasing at the same amount of time there. And as has already been outlined now, 
uh, overdose deaths from these prescription pain medicines uh, are, are more common than both uh, heroin and cocaine deaths combined. And if you needed one more other way, this slide is another visual. Lots of people are dying from these medications now, unfortunately. My main point here is again to show how it affects the, the young. See all the death rates there and, and people who are still young. This crisis, unfortunately, really has particularly affected our teenagers and our youth. We've touched base on that a little bit. And, you know, you could really describe it in lots of different ways. Some of this data has already been uh, shown to you, but about 20% of high school teenagers now say they've tried a prescription pill. Uh, it is now... More, almost as commonly abused as, medic, as, uh, as marijuana. That's quite a dramatic change. And given how dangerous and addicting these pills are, it's, 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 it's quite a sobering change in the demographics. Um, unfortunately, and this are teen reports, only about a third of teens report that they learn a lot about the, the risks of these medications from their parents. And so, as was already mentioned earlier, what we have here, we have a real perception problem. A real perception problem. Uh, the, the youth are not seeing that these medications are so dangerous, particularly so dangerous. So we have to you know, try to impact that. And to me, the last point kind of confirms that, that 70% of first-time users get these medications from friends or families, the medicine cabinet, friends in schools or whatever. It's not like they're on the west side dealing with some drug dealer, you know. It's different. So again, this perception problem has to be addressed Um, what do, what's the situation in Western New York? This has already been outlined. We have a problem here. Our community particularly has a big problem with this prescription uh, pill problem. Why? The, my, the, the first point is just my own little thing, because people ask me all the time. So my own thing is that, that Buffalo is such a blue-collar town. It's such a working-class town and good people, and we got the snow, and we got a lot of injuries, and there's just a lot of of our population is exposed to these medications. When I talk to patients, uh, th these pills are everywhere. They're on the job site, they're in the restaurants, they're wherever people are working. Th these medications are available to them. Um, and some of this data, this, the, the, the rest of the data is from the Buffalo News story, the, the stories that did such a good job in chronicling the problem that we have in our community. And basically what that gets down to saying is, in Western New York, we have a much higher rate of prescriptions for these medications than in other parts of the state. In Buffalo, we have a lot of patients who are in treatment for opiate addiction. Uh, we have over 1,000 patients between the three methadone clinics here in the Western New York area that are treated for opiate addiction with methadone. Our clinic uh, is the Pathways Clinic through Sisters Hospital is the largest methadone provider outside of New York City. And what we've seen, what I've seen personally, is really a, a dramatic shift away from patients who prescribe heroin or abuse heroin only to, to patients who really abuse these prescription pills. And most all of our patients now abuse prescription pills. They may abuse heroin too, but it's pretty rare that what we get is only a heroin abuser now. So the call to action, um, which is again the theme of this whole conference, uh, these four uh, areas for improvement, for intervention, were borrowed from the Office of National Drug Control Policy and this document here. All right, it's a very good document. It outlines a national strategy to try to address this problem more specifically. And so what I did is I used those, those talking points, those four areas, as, as a framework from which to um, talk about the rest of the, the talk, which to guide the rest of this talk. Um, and I kind of added in some of my own ideas into the framework that's already been um, um, uh, outlined uh, fr from this paper. So. The first area is education, and it is an education that I feel like from a medical standpoint that really we could make the most improvement and really impact this problem in the most significant way. When you look at medical school, 
education, medical residency education. Uh, this data, again, already uh, has been presented, but we're not getting a great education on, on, on this problem, on substance abuse problems, okay? Only about 50% of programs in 2000 had any education at all. And, even, and you can see, even when there was at some education, it was really quite, quite, quite little. Three to 12 hours when your residency is three, three years long. Um, and, you know, that's improved some, but it's still quite inconsistent. And I'm, I'm just here to tell you that training outside of a specialty addiction uh, program is still, for the most part, pretty minimal and, for the most part, fairly inadequate, all right? Um, on top of that, unfortunately, we're not getting great training in the proper diagnosis and treatment of chronic pain as, as well. So that's a close corollary, of course. So not only don't we really know how to identify and treat addiction, we're not as, as good as we should be, in the medical profession, I mean, at diagnosing and treating chronic pain. And again, these two areas interlap so intimately. I will tell you just from my own experience, I had almost really no training in my medical training whatsoever. Everything I've learned has been since I graduated from my medical residency. Physicians have a real important role in educating our patients and their, par their parents, of course. This slide I put up here because it, it's very interesting to see how this perception problem can be impacted. Now, these graphs show uh, tobacco use and the perceived risk of tobacco. And, and if you can see the red, the red line is use, the, the blue line is the perceived risk. So as the perceived risk of tobacco use increased, over the last couple of decades, then the use of tobacco decreased. You could see how those two things follow each other. So, and, and over time, we've really had a nice decrease in the use of tobacco in, in, in high school age ch uh, kids. So the, the same thing, I believe, could be done with, with these opiates. If we could increase the sense that these medications are risky, that there's a much better chance that, that, that the use will, will decrease. My own interest in all of this is helping doctors to identify patients who might be at risk for addiction and for crafting treatment plans that um, take into consideration the risks of opiate therapy. Um, we need to do a better job, physicians, of identifying patients who are at risk to develop addiction. There are, this is not real complicated, okay? These are the four main areas that would signify risk in a patient. So if a patient has a really significant family history or they have a history of some other addiction themselves, if they're very young, these are patients that we should really, really be considering whether or not that prescription of opiates is appropriate. And it's always better to avoid the problem, you know, than to try to fix it once it gets started. I'm very interested in helping, again, physicians treat chronic pain properly, recognizing that treating pain with opiates has inherent risks, okay? There are lots of tools, though, to help physicians to do this better. Treatment agreements, which outline the treatment of the responsibilities of patients who are prescribed opiates, are widely available now and really should be standard care. Uh, we go through a very thorough informed cons consent process now. In the past, we really didn't. You know, again, some of this was ignorance. We didn't recognize this potential risk for addiction from these medications. And the primary risk of opiate therapy, frankly, is addiction. Um, toxicology screening is, again, standard care now as far as I'm concerned. Any patient who's prescribed an opiate should get some sort of frequency of toxicology screens to assure that they're taking the medications so that would decrease diversion and to make sure that they're not taking other medications or illegal drugs that would impact their treatment. Very common sense, very low tech. Regular office visits, which seems like a no-brainer, but there are many patients who get a prescription for opiates, don't see their doctor again for six months or sometimes even longer. In the VA system, it can go up to a year. That, that is a situation that is ripe for problems, I'm here to tell you. Give someone a bunch of opiates and hope for the best. That's not the best way to approach this. Um, restricting refill access, again, a no-brainer. Your, your medication's due in a month, you can't fill it until then, okay? It's just some external controls to help patients to take these medications more properly. And creating treatment teams, I always put that in there because, you know, no one person can do this by themselves. 
Uh, we have a very active nursing staff, which is vitally important in helping us manage these patients. Pharmacists, physical therapies, therapists, counselors, all helping to, 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 to optimize the outcomes in these patients. Not to bore you with the medical literature, but the last uh, journal citation there on this slide, I put in there to again show that we really have some opportunity to do better here. This is a study that was just recently released uh, looking at three very, very um, easy risk reduction strategies, okay? Any urine toxicologist found a cohort of pain patients who are on opiate therapy for about two years. Any urine toxicology, regular office visit, which again, they defined as once in six months or within a month after a medication change and restricted refills. How did we do? Not so good. Only 3% had all three. These are not complicated interventions. If they were done regularly, I believe they would make a, a, a big impact. The uh, Office of National Drug Control Policy uh, paper highlighted cooperation with industry. That means working with industry to find abuse resistant products and hopefully someday to find medications that treat pain as well as opiates without all the inherent risks. Of course, we physicians, we have to be active in the medical research. We've got to try to figure out who should get opiates, what's the proper duration of opiate therapy, uh, who are the, uh, you know, what are the uh, p diagnoses for which we should be using these opiates. None of that has really been delineated totally. So we work in a bit of a vacuum, and that is a problem. Um, and of course, all of us physicians, we have to be responsible for keeping current. We may not have learned uh, what we needed to learn, maybe, when we were medical students or residents, but that doesn't excuse us from being responsible for education now. Uh, that gives me an opportunity to plug the conference that's coming up through Independent Health. Uh, it is a, a practical pain management uh, conference for primary care providers to help better delineate who should get opiates and how best to m monitor opiate therapy once it's started. Uh, monitoring. So I already talked about the role of physician monitoring once the opiate therapy is started. It's vitally important. You can't just start this, these medications up and again hope for the best because that is just a totally naive way to approach this. But what the, the, the position paper is really talking about uh, is the prescription monitoring uh, programs. New York State actually kind of has one. It's just not a very good one and it only identifies very aberrant behaviors and it is not a real-time uh, database. So, you know, frankly, from my perspective as a practicing physician, it is not helpful at all. Um, and I think all of us physicians, we can get behind uh, legislation like the Attorney General is talking about that would give us real-time data to make real-time decisions on these patients. And I mean, you don't, again, you don't have to be a doctor to understand. Well, if, if I'm seeing you as a patient and I rec realize that you just got five prescriptions for OxyContin in the last five days, then I'm much less likely to prescribe that to you. The, the physician role in proper storage is very important. I talk to all of my patients about having a, these medications put away. We prefer that they have a lockbox. Um, and talk to them about how to properly dispose of them if they're, if they're no longer taking these medications. Erie County has a very active drug take back program. And as I already mentioned, there's representatives from the county here that are going to talk about that in more detail. And a word on the enforcement, I added legislative options. I think it's become clear from my work in this area that we're going to need some help from the legislators to get this problem better managed. Uh, I will say though that uh, you know, any physician, I think all as physicians would support efforts that would seek to stop those who are really inappropriately prescribing opiates and causing harm to patients. Uh, but this situation, as has already been outlined, is very rare, you know, very rare. F physicians are not madly writing prescriptions and trying to hurt, hurt people. That's not happening. Most of the time it's ignorance, all right? And any efforts that we have, the legitimate efforts, to try to control diversion, I think really need to be balanced with the needs of chronic pain patients. So it's really good to hear other people say that. Because again, I think it's important we don't lose sight. A big reason why this crisis started was because we were trying to treat another bad problem, pain. 
and many people suffer from it. And as of today, no, no other treatment treats pain better than an opiate. And that's what makes this such a very difficult problem. Um, any efforts that seek to just limit the supply of these medications, I think, are short-sighted. Because as I've already outlined, as we've you've already heard three times, there's a lot of people with troubles with these medications, and there's not a lot of access to treatment. There's not a lot of access to treatment. So in my opinion, that needs to be a part of what we're looking at. And we do have places like Washington State. They have an experience of some legislative uh, solutions, if you will. And Washington, it's been mandated that any patients who are on over 120 milligrams of morphine get a pain management consultation. And efforts like this are you know, maybe the really common sense type things that really might make a, a difference. And we should be looking at them as we try to think about what we're going to do in our state. It's important when we think about these problems uh, to, to, to think about what do we do when we've identified someone with a problem, with a problem with these pain medications. And the answer is to get them some help, okay? This is not the kind of problem that people are just gonna figure out on their own. It just does not work that way. These medications are very addictive. They create a very, very high level of physical dependence. And once the addiction cycle gets going, it's just very difficult for people to break free without help. Unfortunately, many people who need treatment don't get it. And that's the first stat there, only about 10% by federal data. But it's important to recognize that treatment does work. People can get better, recovery happens, and you know, frankly, that's why I do what I do, because it's really, really amazing to see someone really struggling with their addiction and to get well. It's, you know, when you treat someone for high blood pressure, you know, no offense to anyone, th their life doesn't change. It's, you don't see, you see dramatic changes when people get better, and that part of it's really good, really good. There are lots of different treatment options. Well, maybe that's an overstatement, but there are traditional, I'll say, treatment options, inpatient, outpatient treatments. But when we're talking about prescription pain medication, really we gotta be considering the medication-assisted treatments, which the primary mode of treatment is the opiate replacement uh, therapies, which are methadone, and suboxone, subutex, which is also buprenorphine, okay? These medications help facilitate a, a patient's recover, recovery, help it so that patients are no longer taking these opiates illicitly. Versus absence-based treatments alone, they are very much more effective. Uh, you know, are they some sort of utopian treatment? They are not, okay? But they really are effective. They need to be considered in these patients when we're thinking about what to do when we have some problems. This quote, um, I found in my uh, research for this talk, I thought it sort of summarized a little bit of what, I, what I'm talking about. And again, this is recently in the medical literature, and I'll just read it. The increasing prevalence of misuse of prescription opioid analgesics attributable to physician prescription appears to be the result of a perfect storm. And that really what it is what it is, a perfect storm of these things coming together. Inconsistent and inadequate phys physician education, lack of sufficient evidence of efficacy and safety of opioids for chronic pain, and the lack of adherence to guideline-based risk assessment and monitoring. So that is true. That's true, unfortunately. I believe this summarizes it pretty well. But we do have a real opportunity to make an impact here. I really believe that, and I, it's, it was great to hear the optimism earlier, because I believe the same thing, that this problem can be tackled. That if we started to do some of these common sense type interventions, that the tide could be turned. I, I totally believe that. So, in summary, I didn't quite know how to sum this up. Prescription drug abuse is here to stay. You know, I just want to sound so pessimistic. But the point I'm trying to make is, is it's not just going away. It's not just going to go away on its own. It's going to require some effort. It's going to require some effort on our part. Um, wishful thinking, half measures, it's not going to get the job done, okay? Uh, we have some serious work ahead of us. That's clear. Uh, the issue, again, quite complex, multifactorial. It's going to take many of disciplines working in cooperation to address, and there is very, very a key role for physician education in all this. Um, and again, we've got the IHA's conference. 
if people can't go to that conference, to find some other conference to, to, to improve our skills so that we can help our patients better. And I just put my uh, number there. Uh, um, if I could be of any assistance to people, particularly any practices or practitioners um, who would be interested in assessing how they prescribe opiates and monitor uh, ongoing opiate therapy. And with that, I will conclude, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Updike. We're extremely fortunate in Western New York to uh, be able to have a physician of your talent and also sensitivity and knowledge here in our Western New York area. Um, in terms of uh, the legislative approach, uh, you're right also, uh, New York State uh, does have an important role to play. And we are fortunate to have uh, the staffs and, and indeed some of the elected officials from the state level legislative branch. I know uh, State Senator Tim Kennedy is here as well as uh, Assemblyman Robin Schiminger and their members of staff. And uh, perhaps members of the public at the breaks can uh, take advantage of your break by not only uh, doing what you need to do in terms of refreshment and, and stretching, but perhaps uh, convey to them your personal firsthand uh, interest in legislation.